Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for gathering. Uh, thank you uh, for helping us uh, continue the Dean's Innovative Leader Series uh, with, uh, I'll mention just in a minute, an amazing speaker uh, and a, a wonderful alum. Uh, before turning to John Kravchik, though, I'd just like to uh, say how uh, amazed uh, I am, how grateful I am at the way the MIT Sloan community has come together over the last 10 days. Everybody here knows it's not been a normal period. But we are coming back to a place where we're doing the great work that we do. We're having the exchanges of the great ideas that make this an amazing place. And the Dean's Innovative Leader Speaker Series and our activity right here today is a part of that. So thank you for making time in what is still an extraordinary schedule to do exactly this. So let me just say a few words about today's speaker, John Kravchik. <clears throat> John, as you know, is president and CEO of Hyundai Motors America. John is also, I'm proud to tell you, an MIT Sloan alum. <clears throat> uh, John is a member of the great class of 1988. And for those of you who don't need your calculators, that means that this is John's 25th reunion year coming back to MIT. We are proud and delighted uh, at John's engagement with us uh, and at his willingness to make this 20th, 25th uh, anniversary uh, so special for all of us. Uh, now, uh, John uh, is an extraordinary person in multiple respects. Uh, certainly, the leadership that he's shown in industry is extraordinary. He was a standout even during his time as a student at MIT Sloan. Uh, if I may just ask our current students, how many of you have published a paper in a major industry academic journal so far during your time? No, okay, I'm not gonna show up, not gonna ask for a show of hands. Uh, but John did uh, just that. His article, which appeared in 1988, in the Sloan Management Review called Triumph of the Lean Production System is not only a testament to John's innovative capacity for thought and activity as a student, it's also a citation classic that stood the test of time for Sloan Management Review and faculty and business leaders still refer to that paper even now. So after today's talk, let's get back to business. <laughs> John, uh, uh, after leaving MIT Sloan, uh, went and did uh, what a number of folks do. He uh, did some work in consulting. Uh, in 1999, he, jo he joined uh, Ford. And in 2004, he joined Hyundai and took on his current responsibility in 2008. In the time since, John's uh, leadership role in 2008 Hyundai's North American market share has grown by 50% during what we might describe as some uncertain and challenging times, to say the least. And John's own leadership style has also been the subject of a great deal of interest. One of the things that many of you may know about John is his pattern of dealing with a customer complaint a day. Now, I'm a little worried that coming out of today's session, we might adopt that perspective on the dean of MIT Sloan School <laughs> dealing with a complaint a day, but we're just gonna have to take the risk. In the meantime, would you please very warmly welcome John Kravchik. Consider getting into that aspect of, of business, and it is sort of business, writing your own papers, because I gotta tell you, I still have uh, an important revenue stream, a revenue stream, uh, from papers related to that, the book, the machine will change the world. 
which nets me upwards of, this may be a hundred bucks a year. <laughs> it's not bad. Um, I, I'm happy to be here for a lot of reasons, and, and one of the reasons is because so far everyone I've spoken with here has pronounced my company's name correctly. It's Hyundai. It rhymes with Sunday. Um, and it's amazing how many times that's mispronounced. Um, we go by Hyundai, it rhymes with Sunday. Um, I thought I would start my remarks today um, with a little story of, of how I found MIT, um, and then take you on, on a little bit of my journey as a leader and, and how I've ended up at, at, at Hyundai. John, yes. is your mic on? Oh. No. Sorry. How's that? Is that better? Yeah. Here, this may look strange. Michael Cusimano just took a photograph of that. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure that's going to be tweeted around the world. We didn't have social media to deal with last time I was on campus. But. Um, so I'm, I'm the last of eight kids, actually, which is, which is sort of a good thing, because I, I got to see a lot of role models and non-role models and, and learn things to follow and things not to follow. But one of my older brothers had gone to Q Boo Chorus, Wharton School of Business. Wharton School of Business, yeah. And yeah, and he, he encouraged me to do the same. Um, so I dutifully went out and, and visited the Wharton campus, and I, I thought it was okay. This is circa 1986, a long time ago. Um, I thought it was okay, and, but I wanted to, and I don't know why, but I wanted to check out MIT. It was, it was the only other school in my consideration set. So I came out uh, here to have a look, and it was before there was a sky bridge to building E40, um, and that was one of the reasons I think that I probably chose, you know, I, I wasn't thinking good about it. It seemed to be a darker place. It wasn't as bright, um, and plus the weather was, was horrible when I came and visited. Um, so I had pretty much decided at the end of my day uh, here at MIT Sloan School that, that I would go to Wharton. But something, somehow, had me go to the Career Planning Center. Do you remember this, Jim Wolak? Do you remember this? And, and there was a cork board there, because that was how we used to transmit information back in the day, uh, with a 3 by 5 index card. And on that index card it said, Automotive industry analyst wanted. Um, there's a $40,000 annual salary attached to it on the index card. I, I don't know why. And it said, call Jim Walmack if interested and had Jim's phone number. And I was, I was headed off to um, uh, the airport in a couple of hours. Now, I didn't have to pick up the phone in the career center. <clears throat> and I, I don't know why I did, but I did. Because I, I was a car guy. I loved the auto industry. I was, I was working in NUMI, the GM Toyota joint venture at the time. And I wanted my business school education to have something to do with cars, because I've loved cars since I was two years old. Um, so I called Jim, and I said, hey, Dr. Womack, um, I'm, I'm here, and, and I'm wondering, what is an automotive industry analyst, and, and what do they do at MIT? And Jim asked what I, what I was doing right now, and I said, well, I work at NUMI. And he said, stop right there. You need to come and talk to me. Uh, my my uh, office is right across the street. So I went across, to see, across the street to see Jim at E4219, something like that, E4219. And, and we chatted for a little bit. And I told him about NUMI and, and how we were you know, working under a Toyota production system. And he was intrigued by this. Of course, he was thinking of the next book that he was just getting ready to write. He gave me a copy of a book that he had co-authored called The Future of the Automobile. And Jim's kind offer was, read this book on the way back to, uh, to the Bay Area. I was living in, uh, in Palo Alto, California. And let me know if you'd be interested in maybe doing some research work for me on the way to getting an MBA at Sloan School that we could probably help pay for. Now, not having a lot of money, I thought it was a great deal. And by the time I landed in San Francisco, um, Jim had sealed the deal with this incredible book called The Future of the Automobile. And, and I left NUMI early uh, to spend the summer before uh, doing some research here. We, uh, we went to the Framingham, Massachusetts car plant, which is now since shuttered. Um, and I wrote a little paper called Learning from NUMI, which led to this, this, this thing called the Triumph of the Lean Production System. Um, and I had a great time. I had a great time. Back then, you had to do a thesis. You had to do a dissertation to get a master's. And actually, I don't have an MBA. I have a master's in, in management. Do you, do you still have that distinction here? Yeah. How many people here write a, a, a dissertation as, as a master's? Uh, and you're all master's students? 
Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. What is the is it majority? Majority write a, a dissertation? Minority? Mm -hmm. Opposite. Maybe. Yeah. No, that's okay. You guys taking the time to do that research? You're doing the right thing. This is my opinion. I had a great time, and by the time I was done, I had visited 90 different assembly plants in 20 different countries, and. I saw the entire automotive industry. Um, I saw every major player. I saw just about every country that was making automobiles. Um, and it was all because of MIT and Jim, Michael Cusimano, uh, research colleagues like Toshi Nishiguchi here, um, folks like John Paul McDuffie. It was an absolutely amazing experience. So I did do after that what, what many people do after an experience like that. I tried to sell the experience. I had my own little consulting company for a year or two. Um, but I, I didn't really enjoy that. Um, I thought that consulting was interesting and it was intellectually stimulating, um, but I didn't have the opportunity to really make a difference um, and, and really change something. I, I, I thought the best way to change something was to go actually work for the company and sort of work your way up. I had a very romantic sense of that. So I went to work for Ford. It was actually in 1990. I went to work for Ford. Uh, a couple of years after I left uh, Sloan School. And I literally worked my way up. I was a, a product, first level product development supervisor in the light truck division. And I was um, engineering control arms and stabilizer bars and bushings and coil springs and things like that, learning how to design cars. Um, and I did that for several years, eventually became a chief program engineer. I'm somewhat embarrassed to say for the Ford Expedition. No. Yeah, but it was fabulously successful. And, and, and while I was the chief engineer for that product, we were making um, about 250,000 expeditions and Lincoln Navigators, its sister car, a year from one assembly plant called Michigan Truck in Wayne, Michigan. And that plant by itself for Ford Motor Company was generating two to three billion dollars in pre-tax profit per year. Absolutely amazing. Um, it was, um, I think, the most profitable assembly plant ever for a short period of time um, until we figured out that we really all shouldn't be driving 5,500 pound um, large sport utility vehicles. Um, so I had a great time at Ford. I actually worked there for 14 years. Um, and I left in, in 2004. And if you think about the industry at that time, I don't know how many of you are, are interested in the car industry. I, actually, I have to ask. How many of you have, have some fundamental interest in the auto industry? And don't be shy. Wow, really, that's a lot. I'm surprised. How many of you want to work in the auto industry? That's significant. How many of you want to work for Hyundai? <laughs> so, two. <laughs> no, I, I see a lot of people. That's great to see. Um, you can see me after the seminar. But um, it, Ford, Ford at the time was, was in an interesting state of transition. It was before uh, the wonderful Alan Mulally just become a bit of a friend, um, joined a Ford. And the, the atmosphere and the, and the culture there was toxic. And I, I literally didn't want to do anything else at Ford. So I was looking around. And um, there was just a, this little, little company called Hyundai. This was about 2002 that, that we had our first interaction, who I hadn't really noticed on the auto industry scene before. I had, of course, visited one of their plants um, and, and thought it was an interesting plant. This was back in 1988, 1989. Uh, just three or four years after they began selling cars in the US. And I was intrigued by this company. So um, I went out and, and went to my local Hyundai dealer in, Ar in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and, and uh, drove some of the cars. And they were terrible. They, they, were, they were surprisingly terrible in, in terms of driving dynamics, which is what I was really interested in at the time. Um, but there was a certain quality uh, and cheekiness to the brand that, that I thought was really interesting. And they were looking for someone to guide their, their product efforts in the US. So I talked to them in 2002, and it was sort of a casual conversation. But by 2003, 2004, we decided, yeah, it, it might make sense for me to come work for that company um, and vice versa. So I started my, my, uh, my career with Hyundai in 2004 as the guy in charge of US product. And I had this extraordinary opportunity at that time uh, to be working with this company that had really extraordinary passion, but didn't really know all the things that they needed to know to get it done. But they were hiring a lot of people to help them get there. Um, and I think the transformation the brand has had from 2004 to now has been pretty cool. Um, and, and that's what I wanted to share with you now. Um, 
uh, with, with sort of the, the formal aspect of this presentation. Um, call this Defy, Design, and Delight, and, and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, Alex Taylor, who is an old friend of, of, of MIT and the International Motor Vehicle Program, wrote this story not so long ago, which I love. I've got a huge uh, poster of this on the wall in my office. The toughest car company of them all. Hyundai is for real. Competitors hate them and, and customers love them. Um, and I think that's true. And one of the interesting things about when I joined Hyundai was in 2004, really weren't on the radar screen of our competitors. Um, which is really nice. I can tell you it's really, really nice because my job now is probably 100 times tougher than it was 10 years ago. Now everyone knows about Hyundai and all of our competitors um, attack us in very, very real ways in the marketplace and other ways. Um, it's much better when you're under the radar, for sure. Um, so when I joined the company in 2004, there were, there were these charming um, global philosophy little billboards in every conference room uh, around the world. And this, this was our F Fountain Valley headquarters um, back in 2004, a picture from that day. And our company philosophy was, I love these three words, diligence, frugality, and, and harmony. When was the last time you even heard the word frugality? <laughs> Isn't it the least sexy word you could ever imagine in a corporate motto? Um, but I love that aspect. And of course, it sort of speaks to lean production in a way, I think in a very, uh, in a very Korean way. But um, I am quite certain uh, Hyundai is the most frugal company on the planet, uh, for sure, Toshi. We could talk more about that. But I, but I wanted to talk a little bit about, about how those things actually manifest. Um, so this word diligence, um, and Toshi, you, you, you would love this one. Um, I, I have heard many times this phrase that the people who work at Hyundai make the Japanese seem lazy. I don't know if that resonates at all, but they are just the hardest working bunch of folks um, at Hyundai. It's, uh, it's extraordinary. And we have this management philosophy uh, where we say we never set a target that we know how to hit. We never, we never set a target that we know how to hit. Um, so the whole culture is sort of driven by this idea that very, very stretched targets drive extraordinary levels of accomplishment. And it's a very difficult thing to live with and work within if you, if you, don't, if you don't have the right mindset going into it. Um, and it, it's challenging, actually, for a lot of the American executives who, who have worked with Hyundai in the past. Um, and I, I think now that we, we found a way to Americanize this. But it's, it's definitely a challenge from a cultural standpoint. Um, but it really exercises your mind. Um, one of the things we do intentionally at the company is to disadvantage every division from a resource standpoint. You never get what you want. And, and one of the goals of management at Hyundai is to sort of short every division equally so that every division, every group around the company is operating with an equal amount of pain. Um, we like to say, therefore then, that the one thing you've got to use is innovation to deliver those stretch targets. Um, you're never going to get the, the capital budget you want. You're never going to get the headcount that you need. Um, but we encourage you to innovate all you would like in infinite capacity to deliver the stretch targets that, that seem impossible. Um, we talk about frugality a lot. And, and I would say the way the lean aspect of Hyundai delivers is primarily in time. Um, in time. So we have a, a sort of a clock speed reference that we call Hyundai speed. Um, that we use at Hyundai. And the most important aspect of a lot of what we do is really focused on time and getting things done um, extremely quickly. We will frequently sacrifice um, quality of event, believe it or not, um, for getting something done quickly. Not quality to the end customer, um, but perhaps quality of decision. Um, we won't spend a lot of time looking at data um, we often use the simple Pareto principle concept of, you know what, We've see enough, we see enough of a pattern here. We can wait longer to see how this is going to turn out. But we have a good hunch of where it's going to turn out. Let's just go and get this thing done. And I'll give you a couple of examples of that going forward. Um, and Harmony enabled by a lean organization. My favorite comparison of my company. Um, about 20 miles up the 405 in Southern California is Toyota Motor Sales, sort of our competing organization on US soil. They have 40 vice presidents at Toyota Motor Sales. We have five. 
and, and the, the scope of our organizations are the same. They have more volume than us, it's true. Um, but imagine trying to get something done in an organization where you have 40 vice presidents compared to an organization where you have five. I'll take the organization where you have five any day. Um, these are just some examples of things that we've done in rapid speed. Um, the one thing I, I want to bring, bring to light um, is, is a marketing program that you may or may not remember. Um, it was late 2008, uh, the Lehman Brothers collapse and the start of the Great Recession. Um, and the auto industry was in utter, complete, total turmoil and chaos. Um, there was talk of bankruptcy uh, among the Detroit Big Three, an absolutely untenable idea. Um, and we were struggling too, as every automaker, we were struggling too. Um, and we came up with this concept called Hyundai Assurance, which was a simple idea that if you lose your job and you had just purchased a Hyundai, you could return the car back to Hyundai and we would take it back, no questions asked, and you wouldn't have to worry about any impact on your credit. Very, very simple idea. Um, resonated with consumers in a very major way in the automotive media uh, is an example of clever thinking um, to solve a problem and really deliver for the customer and, and attack a root cause issue, which was consumer confidence, right? Um, it really, really worked for us. The amazing thing about Hyundai Assurance is that that idea came not from inside Hyundai, but from an external supplier. When we heard the idea, um, we thought this is a great idea. Um, and in Hyundai Speed, we didn't do a lot of analysis. We just said, no, this, this will work for us. We went from the concept demonstration meeting um, at Hyundai from the supplier to ads on television in 37 days. The supplier later told us that they were trying to get a meeting with any of the Detroit Big Three, and it was taking more than 37 days just to get the first meeting. And we did the whole program in that time. And what was wonderfully ironic and deliciously ironic was after we launched that program, the Detroit Big Three all copied the same program. But of course, it didn't work because they didn't have the, the, uh, the advantage of first mover. Um, so the dean talked a little bit about um, the growth and market share that we've experienced. It's actually been a bit of a ride. And it's sort of funny when, when people consider Hyundai to be an overnight success story because it has been a long journey. Um, the brand launched in the U.S. as the best-selling first-year imported brand in the history of the U.S. auto industry and quickly uh, sold over 250,000 units, enough to gain uh, just about two points of market share in the U.S. Um, but in Hyundai speed fashion, the, the cars weren't very good, and, and quality of event had been sacrificed here. Um, we sold a lot of cars in the first couple of years on the market, but they weren't very good. And that came back to bite the company. The reputation for quality was very poor. And you see the market share slide that happened in the early 90s because of that. Right. Um, you can see, though, we experienced an uptick. Let's see if I can. There we go. This uptick here happened as a result of one marketing idea. Oh, no. One marketing idea and a product idea. Does anyone know what the marketing idea that, that sparked this growth was here? It's another marketing concept. It's called America's Best Warranty. It was a 10-year, 100,000-mile warranty. The basic idea was we know internally the quality of our products is great, but we've totally screwed up the American perspective on how good Hyundais really are because of the poor quality in the early 90s. So the simple idea was let's back the quality with a 10-year warranty, and it worked. It was another idea in that sort of assurance umbrella of telling customers, you know, you don't have to worry about the, the quality of a Hyundai. We've got your back for 10 years. Um, the other big thing that really moved us along was the launch of, of the Santa Fe, the Hyundai Santa Fe from a product standpoint, which brought the brand out of just a compact uh, fuel efficient car mode to, to more of a full line automaker. And since that point, really, the growth has been um, very straightforward. This was the, um, um, that Lehman Brothers year, and you can see part of the rocket fuel that we had from here to here, uh, a big portion of that was that growth associated with the Hyundai Assurance program and really getting on the American car buyer's shopping list. One little known aspect of our success has been how well we're doing in the premium side of the market. You guys may have heard of the Hyundai Genesis and the Hyundai Equus, two of our premium cars. Um, we launched the Genesis also in 2008. 
um, as the auto industry was collapsing. You'd say horrible timing. It actually worked out really well for us because during that time, um, people were really questioning and thinking deeply um, on their automotive purchases. Um, and default um, purchase items like BMWs, Mercedes, and Lexus, among those who had a bit more money to spend, really um, changed. Those people's thinking changed and gave us a chance with a car like the Genesis, which offered all of those premium attributes, but at a much lower price point. Um, so Genesis launched very well, and we've followed successfully with, um, with Equus. And so now the interesting story is, although, we've, although Hyundai has about a 5% share of total industry, if you just look at our share on the premium side with vehicles like Genesis and Equus, we're actually doing a little bit better uh, than the brand as a whole. The household income of uh, Hyundai buyers now increasing, and I, I think this is surprising to a lot of people. Maybe a lot of you still have this conception that Hyundai is more of a bargain, ba bargain basement brand, uh, but you can see the, the average household income now of a Hyundai buyer is just about $90,000. And our two core models, uh, the midsize Sonata and the compact Elantra, uh, doing, doing very, very well. Those levels, by the way, are higher um, than the average Japanese Big Three um, counterpart, Toyota, uh, Honda, and Nissan. And here you get a sense for that. It didn't used to be that way. Uh, Camry buyer back in 2006, a little bit more affluent than the Sonata buyer. Um, today that is reversed. So Defy Design Delight, I mentioned, um, I mentioned that mantra, sort of replacing um, this diligence, frugality, and harmony that I showed you earlier. The company has really transformed itself over the last 10 years for a lot of different reasons. And the spirit in the company now, I think, is best defined by that first word, defy. Uh, and the basic thinking there is, at Hyundai, we, we've all got this point of view. If the, the entire industry is moving to the right, we'll have a look to the right, and we'll study it. And maybe we'll go in that direction. But we'll probably spend more time looking to the left looking for white space, um, or you might want to call it blue water, uh, but looking for a place to play where someone hasn't thought of. Um, we think there's more opportunity there. And there have been a lot of examples of that. This one um, is certainly one of them, the, the Genesis in 2009. Um, when we launched the current iteration of the Sonata, this is sort of um, auto industry inside baseball, but at that time, the conventional wisdom in the industry was if you're launching a mid-sized car, you had a four-cylinder and a V6 engine. Um, I have to ask this question. Um, you guys know what four-cylinder and V6 engines are? Like motors and things like that? Because sometimes I take that for granted and people don't know. Um, but, but the orthodoxy was, yeah, you have a four and a six and you let consumers decide. Um, but there's a huge economy to be had and an efficiency to be had if you design your platform around just one shaped power pack, just a, a, an inline four-cylinder engine. You can make the hood lighter or lower. You can make the whole vehicle lighter by 50 or 60 pounds and give you a tremendous fuel economy and design advantage. Um, but it's a risky proposition because typically 25% of mid-sized car buyers say, I want a V6. Um, so our idea was, you know what, we'll, we'll let all those guys go. And we'll design the best four-cylinder uh, mid-size sedan that you can imagine. And oh, by the way, we'll put a two-liter turbo under the hood as well, and that will offer the, the performance characteristics of a V6, but, but get, a, get better fuel economy. It was a risky plan, um, but it worked very well. And the Sonata very quickly became one of the best-selling mid-size cars. Fueled by this combination of um, uh, a light and efficient powertrain, and some really bold and daring new design. How many of you know this car, the Hyundai Veloster? It's OK if you don't. Well, that's cool. Um, I like to say that this is a car only Hyundai could design. Um, no one's ever done a three-door like this before, um, with two forward hinge doors on the passenger side. We call this the social side, and one traditional um, large door on the driver's side, more the, the personal side, the sporty side. Um, very unconventional, sort of defies convention. I had a lot of fun um, putting this product together with our R&D team. And it's done extremely well. Only Hyundai, I think, would ever do uh, a product like this one. Decidedly unconventional. Design is in our mantra now because we realize at a very profound level the importance of design 
in everything we do. And I would say that Hyundai of, of all brands was very, very slow to get to this point. And, and I will demonstrate that with this slide. Um, <laughs> you can see the evolution of the Sonata um, and how it had been you know, a, a very conventional three box design in its first iteration. Um, you, you could see in the past many aspects of other designs as you go forward. This one was a ripoff of a Jaguar. Um, a very conventional um, uh, three box in the iteration before this one. And now the, the current Sonata, which is uh, just a beautiful, very, very sculptural design that people are buying because they feel this emotional attachment to the design, because they want that car in their driveway because of the way it looks, not because of its warranty or because of the fuel economy. But now for Sonata, one of the driving purchase reasons is design. And that, what we call fluidic sculpture design language, has now informed pretty much the entire uh, Hyundai lineup. And, and we've seen this in, um, in the changing mood of the American car buyer. This is, this is data for um, American car buyers in general, not just for Hyundai buyers. Um, exterior styling is a purchase reason, major purchase, purchase reason has gone from 69% in 2008 to um, 81% in, in 2012. That's a big move um, in our industry. Um, and you even see that same sort of beauty in our, um, in our compact cars. That's our, our C-Class car, the Elantra, the Veloster. And we've got more of it coming. This is a concept car we showed at the Detroit Auto Show this year called HCD14. Um, we have the next generation Genesis undergoing final development right now. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to showing this car at Detroit next year. But the production version of the Genesis is gonna have a lot in common with that beautiful concept car you see there. Um, my final point on, on delight, um, and, and I want to use what I mentioned earlier on the premium side, what we've done with the premium aspect of our, uh, of our vehicle line. You know, the conventional wisdom in the auto industry is that a brand like Hyundai shouldn't launch premium products, that Hyundai should follow what Toyota and Nissan and um, Honda did with their premium products and launch a separate proper premium brand. So Toyota, as, as you may know, has Lexus, and Honda has Acura, and Nissan has Infiniti. They decided that their popular brands, their highest volume brands, really weren't good enough for their very, very best cars. And we took a different point of view at Hyundai. We thought, yeah, that's sort of a self-defeating prophecy. Why would you say that? Your very, very best products aren't deserving of your primary brand label. What's up with that, you know? Um, so we, we took this point of view with, with Equus and with Genesis to launch them through the Hyundai dealer network. And with that idea, we realize a lot of advantages for the brand as a whole. Now I'll admit, maybe this isn't the best way to maximize sales of your premium models, um, but it's a really good thing for your business unit as a whole. And there are things that you can do to sort of minimize the impact that it might have on premium buyers interacting with non-premium buyers in a Hyundai showroom. And, and with Equus, we've taken that, I think, to a pretty high level. And I was pleased to see, actually, for those of you who follow the industry and follow uh, Tesla and Elon Musk, um, uh, Tesla announced last week this fabulous new idea where if you buy a Tesla, and you have any maintenance issues with it, say your Tesla breaks down, uh, Tesla will send uh, another Tesla to your house or your business, wherever you are, as a free loaner car. They'll pick up your Tesla, bring it back to their shop and fix it. Meanwhile, you're driving around in a brand new Tesla and um, they'll bring the car back to you. Sort of a valet service. This is a breakthrough idea. The only problem is we've been doing that at Hyundai with the Equus for the last two or three years and he did not give us attribution. I can't believe that. Um, we call it your time, your place, and at your service. But if, if you want to buy a Hyundai Equus, um, we, we've had this in place since we launched the car in 2010. Um, you just give us a call or make an appointment on, on, uh, on our website, and we'll come to your home or business and demonstrate the car. And you can complete the car sale um, at your home or your business. Um, you don't have to go to the dealership ever to buy an Equus. The same thing with Equus at your service, which is the, the maintenance program. You never need to come to a Hyundai dealer. If, you're, if you want your oil changed, just give us a call. We'll pick it up, 
leave you an Equus or a Genesis loaner, change your oil at our cost, and bring it back to you. Um, it's called Equus at Your Service. And it was our idea to avoid this whole issue of, oh, the Hyundai dealership isn't a nice enough place for someone to spend time. Let me tell you something. A Lexus customer doesn't want to go to the Lexus dealership. It's the last thing they want to do. Even with a putting green there and, uh, and a nice cappuccino machine, they still don't want to go, right? And, and, and that's the fundamental problem that I think the premium retailers are missing. So, so our big idea was to just take the dealership out of it entirely um, and give people back what they have the least amount of, especially people in this income category. And that's time. That was, that was the insight with Equus. And it, it's, been a, it's, been a wonderful, um, it's been a wonderful success for us. And again, Equus and Genesis do work for us, um, not just in terms of servicing and delighting the premium customer, but think about it this way. All the very best retail ideas that Toyota has, they go to Lexus. So le the Lexus stores are these incredible, I, I call it an isolated island of retail excellence, right? The best people, the best processes that Toyota has on the retail space go to Lexus. The same for Infinity, the same for Acura. And they sort of have to reserve them for those folks. And, and so they have a two-tiered strategy, right? The, the people with the most money buying the best cars, get the best services and everyone else gets something that's not quite as good. Um, we're trying to change that at Hyundai so that by retailing Equus and Genesis through our Hyundai stores, we're training all of our Hyundai associates and all of our dealerships um, so that they can deliver great customer service for the folks who buy a $16,000 Hyundai Accent um, as well. It's pretty cool, and it's working for us. We're now the, the highest retail satisfaction brand uh, among all of the Asian car companies and have made a major improvement um, in this aspect of our business over the last couple of years. So I want to close with um, just a couple of comments. And, and I love this continuity um, between our founding chairman at Hyundai, a guy named J.Y. Chung. Um, he had this thing that he used to say whenever one of his team members would come to him with, with one of these, you know, they'd been given an impossible task, what looked like an impossibly stretched target. And they would come to the chairman and say, Chairman, we, we don't know how to get this done. You know, it seems impossible. And he would always ask, have you tried? The simple question, have you tried? You know, um, I think it, it, it speaks to this uniquely optimistic point of view that this guy had. And I love the comparison of J.Y. Chung and this guy, who you also know, Henry Ford. And he had this wonderful saying, too. Basically the same thing. Basically the same thing. Have you heard this, Jim? Yeah. If you believe you can or you can't, you're right. Um, I think it's really cool that J.Y. Chung and Henry Ford, two different people, two different leaders, two different cultures, the same auto industry, um, had this incredibly optimistic point of view. And I think that's one of the things that fuels great leaders. I mean, it's no coincidence that these two have done great things, right? And I'm not, I'm not saying that cockeyed optimism is the answer to, uh, to all things. Um, but I think in an industry as complex as the auto industry, it's, it's something that helps. So with that, I would love to take any questions you guys may have. Thanks for listening. Any questions? Yeah. Hyundai versus uh, Volkswagen Detroit 3 today. I'll tell you, they're, um, they're all great companies. Volkswagen's an amazing um, company. Um, I, I will form a couple of contrasts for you, though. I don't know of another company, another mature company in any industry that's done what Hyundai's doing right now in terms of voluntarily capping production. I don't know if you guys, if you follow the industry closely or not, but um, we decided in the last couple of years, that we weren't going to grow, that we weren't going to add production, even though there's remarkable demand for Hyundai products around the globe right now. We're severely undercapacitized right now. And at the very highest levels of our company, we've decided, you know what? We're not going to put in new production facilities in the US or Korea. We'll, we'll, we'll add some plants in developing markets. But basically, capping global production to solidify our processes. 
So we're giving up on short-term growth, which is definitely there, and short-term profitability opportunity, which is definitely there, um, in the interest of building a base that will establish long-term growth. I think it's pretty unprecedented. I, and I challenge, if, if anyone can think of another company that's done this, I'd love to hear, because I've been racking my brains trying to think of one. I think it's really cool. Um, I think that strategy is in contrast to, for example, Volkswagen. Volkswagen's in a situation right now where they have made and continue to make very public pronouncements of their you know, local volume um, goals. They want to hit a million units, Volkswagen and Audi, by 2018, uh, and global volume goals. And it's, it's just a risky business. Um, we see Nissan doing the same kinds of things. And when you have volume, unit volume, which is really a stupid target, unit volume is your overriding corporate objective, you end up doing really silly things um, and things that you're going to regret going forward. So I'm, I'm very proud of, of our company's transformation because I'll tell you, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, Hyundai was one of those companies. Hyundai was a company whose overriding goal was volume. And it wasn't even sales volume, ironically, it was just it was production volume. <laughs> As long as we make them, someone will buy them somewhere. Because every car ever made has been sold. It's an interesting story. Um, but yeah, I think that is, that's, that's one primary uh, difference. Detroit Big Three have come a long way. Um, but I would leave you this, this point on the Detroit Big Three. I think, I think the Detroit Big Three CEOs, actually it's Detroit Two, and, and then there's an Italian company, Fiat Chrysler. Um, and, and the business press really needs to get that right because it's, it's not Detroit Big Three anymore. Um, but this is one of the least talked about things in our industry and I don't understand why. Um, probably 85 to 90% of the profits of the three automakers headquartered in Detroit come from tariff protected segment of the industry. Um, pickup trucks and vans still have a 25% tariff so when our US trade representatives go to China and try to create fair and free trade in the auto industry sector with China, the Chinese always say back, well, you guys have a 25% tariff on your trucks. Why, why do you need that? It's impeding our ability in this country to have free trade with, with other countries in the auto sector, which is interesting. But I also think it would be a huge PR bonanza for whichever of the Detroit big three Whichever of those CEOs raised their hand and said to President Obama, hey, we don't need a 25% tariff anymore. We're strong, we're competitive, we own pickup trucks. We don't need that segment protected by tariff. Bring on the world competition. I would love to see that. That would be great. Yeah. The first question is, how much of the decision by Hyundai to cap production is really an inevitable constraint of your suppliers, right? You, you, the suppliers, from what I understand, on the Hyundai side are just unable to uh, provide you with what you need to continue market share growth. Um, so that's one question. And then the second one is with regard to uh, Elon Musk. He also recently has made a very aggressive push into uh, fighting uh, f uh, local franchise laws to have independent dealerships. And you know that, in, in line with uh, Hyundai's move to kind of take Equus out of the dealership, I'm wondering if, if you could either, in, in behalf of Hyundai or manufacturers in general, speak to the idea of protecting uh, dealer uh, franchise laws, or do you see that Elon should have the right to um, own his own dealerships? Yeah, Tesla opens Pandora's box um, with that one. Um, say what you will about the independent U.S. retail distribution system. It's actually pretty efficient. You know, we look at a comparison of, because um, we have a lot of big groups, public companies selling Hyundais, right? And when we compare their performance and delighting customers um, and profitability versus the, the more the private uh, companies. The private companies um, eat them for lunch, both from a profitability standpoint um, and a customer satisfaction delight standpoint. So, so the idea that a factory-run retail model is superior to franchise retail model, I think is somewhat uninformed. And, you know, he'll learn that, I think, at, at some point. Um, it, it also opens up a Pandora's box from the standpoint of the individual states who control the franchise laws um, to the extent that they allow an exception for Tesla. It is going to open up the question, well, if you're letting Tesla do this, 
why can't Fiat, right? Or why can't uh, Mercedes-Benz or, or whatever? At what point do you stop? And then, then you know, there is a, a, a bit of a state of chaos. And when, when you think about those independent retailers, those dealers, um, they are true entrepreneurs. They are true capitalists. They have a lot of their own personal fortune on the line um, in their businesses. And that's what makes those businesses so successful. Um, it's a very different model when you go to a factory retail model. I mean, it's been tried before. Ford tried it uh, with, the, with the Ford Retail Network. And it was a complete failure, an absolute complete failure. A great idea. What was the first question again? Oh, capacity, capping, capping capacity. Um, yeah, I think our suppliers would love us to uncap capacity. Um, and, and one of the reasons we are capping capacity is because of our doubts about our supplier network's ability to deliver quality components at the level we want. Um, so part of what we're doing, I think, is, is training uh, down through the supplier network to make sure that their quality operating systems are up to snuff. Yeah. How about your investors? What about our investors? Have we have a lot of them. Who are your investors and what's their reaction to you having your um, You know, I, I think if you look at our share price, there's probably um, a short-term orientation to the share price, and, and the share price probably isn't as high as it could be if we had just gone on with the growth trajectory that you'd seen on, on some of those slides before. So there's no question we're giving up some short-term share price as well. But I think a lot of our longer-term investors see that this is a good strategy. It's hard. Well, it's hard. It's hard. Because you do the math and you realize, I mean, right now in the US, we're still, um, we've got the third lowest inventory level um, in the industry. The industry runs typically, the industry right now is running about 70 days supply worth of cars. We've got about 32, which sounds like a lot, but it really isn't. It really isn't. Um, it means that a customer who wants to buy a certain Hyundai Elantra in this color with a certain trim package can't find the exact car that they want. They'll have to wait. And so you run the risk of losing those customers. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult. But we are using the time to reinforce the quality systems and make sure that we sort of have permission from the market um, to grow further. Yeah, question up top. Thanks again for coming in to speak with us today. Thank you. Um, where you manufacture in the U.S., and I'd be curious to hear an honest comparison of uh, your opinion of workers in the U.S. and other countries in which you manufacture. Okay. Um, you know, one of the things I did way back when under the tutelage of many of the people here was um, tour assembly plants around the world. And one of the big findings from that study, uh, which is still true today, is that you can have a great production system in any country. It's not the country or the nationality of the worker that determines the productivity or quality of your plant. It's really the management system and approach that makes all the difference. Um, so for Hyundai, like I think a lot of different global companies, very consistent uh, productivity and quality operating uh, plans, very different approaches from local union uh, approach and worker management relations. Korea is actually very challenging. Uh, from, a, from a union standpoint, we have very strong Korean unions, which, which make life challenging for us from a production standpoint. We make, um, here in the U.S., we build our three best-selling cars here, the Santa Fe, Sonata, and Elantra, and we have two plants, one in Alabama and one in Georgia, both running three shifts around the clock. Yeah. Yeah. Um. My, 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 uh, it is a two-part question. Uh, the first question is millennials, millennials are not as interested in cars as previous generations. As for what is uh, Hyundai's strategy towards that? I know uh, General Motors is putting more technology in their lower-end cars. Hmm. Uh, and then the other questions are, um, first, it's got a lot, has had a lot of, uh, has a lot of problems competing with Mercedes, BMW, and luxury brands. And Hyundai has a perceived luxury that it's a lot lower even and, and Cadillac, not even speak about BMW. Uh, what is Hyundai's plan to uh, make that perceived luxury uh, higher since perception is a, a big part mm -hmm. of the equation? Great question. So, so we'll start with the, with the second one on the premium side. We're actually, we're, we're targeting a certain group of, of premium buyers. Um, 
When you think about it, why do you buy a premium brand? Why do you buy a premium brand automobile? Um, there are a lot of different reasons, but one of the reasons for sure is to telegraph a certain social status. And, and from a certain point of view, when you really think deeply about it, um, when you choose a BMW or a Mercedes, there's a certain level of social insecurity that you're demonstrating by making that purchase, right? I know I've just offended all the uh, <laughs> BMW and Mercedes owners here, but it's true. Think deeply. Think deeply. Um, we, um, we've, we are striking a, a, a certain group of affluent owners. We call them um, pragmatic affluence. Pragmatic affluence. They shop at Costco. They are the quiet millionaire next door who he didn't realize had so much net worth uh, accumulated. Um, and they've achieved that via this consumption pattern. They haven't wasted money on premium brands. And trust me, it's a waste of money. No, it really is. A BMW, a Mercedes Benz, it's a waste of money. It really is. Their resale value, their resale value in percentage terms is much lower than a Hyundai Accord. I thought it was amusing, and I don't mean to poke fun at Tesla, but um, you know, Recently, he announced a guaranteed residual value program for the Tesla S, because one of the things people worry about is she has spent $100,000 on the car, it's got a battery in it, might not be worth very much money in three years, what am I going to do? So his idea was to um, guarantee the residual value to be the same as the Mercedes-Benz S-Class, which sounds really good, right? Here's the secret. The Mercedes-Benz S-Class has one of the lowest resale values in the industry. After three years, it's worth 43% of its original price. The average Hyundai resale value is 57% after three years. So really, when you buy a BMW or Mercedes-Benz, you're wasting your money. You're just absolutely wasting your money. And the, the, prag, the pragmatic wealth accumulators of the world know this, and they're flocking to our showrooms to buy Equus and Genesis. Um, millennials, millennials. Um, it is true that millennials aren't buying very many cars, but I think the primary reason for that is because they don't have very much money. Um, and, and cars are getting more expensive. So everyone says, oh, millennials would rather have one of these, and millennials have, we all have to have one of these, right? Um, so interesting statistic. Um, the average age of a car buyer in the US right now is 53 years old, 53 years old. Um, about 65% of American car buyers are in the empty nest stage of, of their lives. Either they never had kids or they had kids and, and they're out of the nest. Um, so most new car purchases are from people fairly late um, in their life stage, in, in the, in the post-family stage. It's interesting. So a lot of it's just, just the, sheer, uh, you know, the sheer quantities and the demographics and, and income. I think we do have a... a you know, and automakers will distinguish themselves by designing cars that do appeal to millennials. We're doing really well, by the way, with millennial crowds, with the millennial crowd in the Veloster, that car I showed you, which in some fashion is a bit of a smartphone on wheels. They all come with built-in seven-inch screen. We designed it in that way to have appeal to uh, millennials. So, yeah, question? We have to stop? and innovation, please, let's express our thanks to John. Thank you, guys. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That was really thanks very much. I'm, I'm sorry we didn't have time for all your questions. Thank you guys so much for listening. You're a great group, and it's so good to be back home. It's awesome to be here. Thanks. No, that's okay.